and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Several years ago, I covered the case of Ariette Gerges on Crime Watch Daily. She was a devoted mother of two with a controlling husband who broke her nose when she asked him to take her out for dinner. Her husband, Magdi Gerges, was arrested and charged with domestic violence. After breaking her nose, Ariat obtained a restraining order against her husband, and he was ordered to move out of their Westminster, California home. She also planned on divorcing him. On September 29th of 2004, two masked men went into Ariat's home. They tied up one of her sons, pushed him in a closet. Then they went after Ariat. She was stabbed to the point of near decapitation. Nearly nine years would go by before Ariette and her sons would see any justice. Westminster police arrested Magdi on February 1st of 2013 on suspicion of murder. He was later convicted of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and received sentencing enhancements for murder for financial gain and murder to prevent testimony. A judge sentenced him to life in prison without parole in 2014. Then investigators got a DNA hit on a second suspect, a man named Anthony Bridget. He was arrested a few months later after Magdi and in 2018 was convicted of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, aggravated assault, and false imprisonment by violence. He also received a special enhancement of murder for financial gain and lying in wait. In October of 2018, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Let's look back at the heartbreaking case of a loving mother who was permanently silenced after trying to seek her own freedom. Now we're emergency. Yeah, well, hey, someone just robbed their house. They broke in. They, they tied me and my mom up. It is the nightmare of a family thought to be living the American dream. They're like, don't make me have to kill you. Don't get your mom killed. Is everybody okay? I don't know. They just beat me up. I don't know where my mom is. The normal life that we had, it's just changed. It's never going to be the same at all. Don't forget that. Never. This American dream actually begins halfway across the world in the land of the pyramids. Ariad was living here in the United States when she took a trip to Egypt and met Magdi. Shortly thereafter, they were married. Ariad and Magdi Gerges didn't fall in love the typical way. It was an arranged marriage. But soon after their love blossomed... Magdi relocated with Ariad to the United States and they bought a home and started a family. Maggie worked around the clock as a successful respiratory therapist and saved every penny to buy his family this home in a secure gated community in Westminster, California. He was an old school Egyptian mentality, so he laid down a lot of like rules, had a very iron fist, was very focused on work. Money was a very, very big thing to him. Ariet worked part-time so she could be a hands-on mom to sons Richard and Ryan. My mom was everything for us, and she was the backbone of the family. Magdi insisted on a traditional Egyptian household where wives are subservient to their husbands and the man controls all the money. My mom never even balanced the budget, never wrote a check. My mom would take her money and just deposit it straight into the bank account. But Ariet's sons say their mom secretly coveted all things American. One time where I walked in and she was like watching Oprah and she was crying and I was like, what's going on? Are you okay, mom? She was like crying to Oprah. And despite Magdi's traditional Egyptian ways, the Gerguses were becoming a typical all-American family. Until one cool, crisp night in September. It's hard to talk about the events that happened that night. The story Ryan is about to relive is one of unholy terror. Ryan arrives home after a late night out with some buddies. I got home sometime past midnight. Um, I ended up going into my room. His father, Magdi, is gone. His big brother, Richard, is at a girlfriend's house. And his mom is fast asleep. 
uh, fell asleep to a brand new um, iPod dock. But in the middle of the night, he says a strange noise jolts him wide awake. I heard a door swing open. Kind of woke up just to see who was coming inside the room. And that's when I felt someone's hand go over my mouth. In the darkness, Ryan fights back, even biting down on his assailant's hand. They kept on making threats, telling me, shut up, because I was screaming for my mom. The gloved intruder, dressed in black, beats Ryan, then wrestles him to the floor. And that's when a second person came into the room, and they started duct taping my hands saying, don't get your mom's killed, don't get your mom's killed. Out of the corner of his eye, Ryan catches a first glimpse of his mother, and he can see panic etched across her face. My mom ran out of her room, frantic, yelling, screaming, take anything you want. Ryan remembers being shoved in his closet, but somehow in the struggle, the duct tape on his hands loosens up. He had me kind of like turn around to where he could like tie a shoestring from one of my shoes on my hands. Through a slight crack in the closet door, Ryan says he sees the other intruder leading his mom into her bedroom. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't, I thought we were getting robbed or something. Moments later, the haunting sound of what he believes is someone cutting and ripping bed sheets. I've never been that scared in my whole life. Finally, footsteps, followed by a car engine. Ryan claims he was unable to move, frozen by fear. I remained in the closet for a, a couple minutes just thinking of like an exit plan and my heart was racing. But what Ryan does next will raise a lot of questions. And I also started to pull really heartily on the duct tape. And then from there, I ran to my phone jetted down the hallway. I looked over towards my mom's door. I just like glanced and then I ran out. You heard right. Ryan Gerges runs right past his mother's room, straight out of the house without ever even checking on her. Then he heads full speed to the neighbor's front door. And first thing I did was I called 911. 911 emergency. Uh, uh, someone just robbed their house. They broke in. They, they tied me and my mama. You have no idea who this is, right? No, it's two black guys. Ryan tells the 911 operator the intruders were two well built African American men who spoke in gang slang. They're like, don't make me have to kill you. I will kill you. Don't get your mom's killed. Don't get your mom's killed. Is everybody okay? I don't know. They just beat me up. I don't know where my mom is. Which begs the million dollar question. Aren't you concerned about your mother? If it were me, I'd be very concerned about my mother. I want you to go back to your house. I know, but I don't want to go back. Police immediately begin to wonder if Ryan Gerges is a witness to a terrifying home invasion, or is he hiding a dark family secret? It still haunts me, definitely. <laughs> Ryan Gerges has survived a horrifying home invasion. But the last time he saw his mother, Ariat, she was being dragged into her bedroom by one of the gloved intruders. Moments later, he hears what he believes to be bed sheets being ripped apart. The nightmare, I couldn't even put it to words. Ryan claims he was so terrified that instead of checking to see if his poor mother was okay, he ran as fast as he could to a neighbor's house to call for help. I really thought I was going to lose my life. When the police arrived on scene, um, it appeared that he had been assaulted. There was abrasions on his face. Detective James Wilson with the Westminster Police says when officers find Ryan, he's still duct taped with shoestrings around his arms and neck. His story seems to add up, but cops still can't quite wrap their heads around why a son would literally abandon his own mother. I would say based on those facts, yes, we were suspicious of Ryan initially. 
Detectives haul Ryan down to the station. He's fingerprinted, swabbed for DNA, and his hands are bagged for evidence. Then detectives start questioning him. Did you have a chance to check on your mom before you ran the house? Nah, I didn't have a chance at all because I was thinking like survival mode. You had to pass by your mom's room or get down the stairs? Yeah, did you I, didn't look, I didn't even look. I just ran as fast as I can. Detectives also asked Ryan's older brother, Richard, to come down to the station. Why would someone pick your house and break it? I don't house? know, man. I wish I knew. I don't know. Detectives purposely keep the brothers in separate interrogation rooms to see if their stories line up. Well, the first reaction I had when he called me was I was like, man, was it one of your friends? Did someone break in or something? That was your first reaction? My first reaction was that. Richard tells detectives he suspects the intruders may be someone Ryan knows who thought there was cash in the house. Did your mom wear expensive jewelry or flash a lot of money? No, oh, man. Do you owe anybody any a lot of money or anything like that? I, you... I don't even know who it is. Detectives want answers, but Richard needs some answers too. Can I my mom, please? Before we go on, please. I, I kept asking him, like, where's my mom? Where's my mom? So I finally told him I'm not going to answer more questions till they tell me what happened to my mom. The answer is like a dagger to the heart. Your mom's dead. So we have a murder investigation. Oh, no, she's not. No, she's not. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Oh, I did hear that. Oh, you sure it's her? Oh, no. His beloved mother, Ariet Gerges, is murdered in the most savage way. Oh, oh, it did not. No, it did not. Richard, take it easy. Oh, damn. No, it did not. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. From then, I just lost it. No! No, she's not! She's not! <laughs> Down the hall, his younger brother Ryan hears Richard's primal screams. When I heard Richard uh, yell really, really loudly inside the police station. That's my little brother, no? Ryan says when he heard those screams, he knew for the first time his mother was dead. <laughs> Uh, they told me uh, um, your mom had passed away. Police say Ariet Gerges was stabbed to death near her bed, and those haunting sounds Ryan heard of what he thought were bed sheets ripping was actually the knife slicing through Ariet's body and ripping her mattress. She was practically decapitated. Sonia Balleste, the homicide prosecutor assigned the case, says Ariet's murder was so violent, it was clear this was a murder with a message. It was overkill, so it wasn't an efficient killing. It was a message killing. Do you have any idea who would want to do that to your mom? Detectives go through the house looking for answers. They are immediately hit with their first clue. The house is in a gated community. You need an access code to get to the house. And then, clue number two. There was no sign of forced entry, and nothing appeared to be missing from the residence. Detectives also find cash and jewelry throughout the house. And then something else interesting. In Ryan's bedroom we found some marijuana um, and a marijuana pipe they also find lots of blood blood was found on the banister the door handle the door leaving the residence but detective Wilson says all that blood belongs to either Ariet or Ryan that was transfer blood from the suspects as they were leaving the location and there wasn't a single foreign fingerprint in the entire house it was almost as if a ghost had committed this crime. But Ryan maintains he saw two African-American men. He even gives police a description of the one-gloved guy who tied him up. And a sketch artist comes up with this drawing, but something still doesn't make sense. My little brother had seen 
the person that tied him up and the people that broke into the house. But they didn't do anything. They wrestled with him, put him in the closet, but they didn't kill him. Detectives can't help but wonder if the drugs found in Ryan's room could have been the motive. Did he owe someone money? But here's the problem with that theory. Why murder Ariat and let Ryan live? So it definitely appeared as if uh, the suspects came to the house for the purpose to kill Ariat. Ariat Gerges is savagely murdered in her own home. It just seemed like all they went for was one purpose, was to murder our mom. Stabbed so violently, she's nearly decapitated. Cold-blooded killer. Ariat's two sons, Ryan, who actually escaped from the vicious intruders with his life, and his older brother, Richard, are questioned separately by police. I, I just love that. So we have a murder investigation. Oh, no, she's not. No, she's not. That's 14. This has to be set up. There's nothing to do with me. The broken-hearted brothers are cleared. Then Ryan shocks investigators when he tells them who he believes was behind their mother's murder. The only person that doesn't really like my mom will be my dad. Their father, Magdi Gerges. There was only one person that had a vendetta against my mom. That was my dad. At the root of Magdi's evil? Money. Prosecutor Sonia Bayeste says Magdi Gerges never loved anyone, including his wife, as much as he loved the almighty dollar. He would worship money. That was his god. Ryan says his father had a sick obsession with making money. It got so bad, he once charged him a buck for a hamburger. He not only made me pay him back for that hamburger, but he also charged me the sales tax that was used to buy the hamburger. Tragically, detectives now believe it was another meal that may have cost Ariat her life. Seven months before her death, Ariat asked Magdi to take her out for a special dinner. Ariat, knowing her anniversary with Magdi was coming, approached him and asked him to take her out to dinner. And this angered Magdi tremendously, and an argument ensued, and he decided to teach Ariat a lesson by punching her in the face, breaking her nose. Richard, who was in nursing school at the time, rushes his mother to the hospital. She was holding like uh, an ice pack to her face and her nose like still had blood like coming out. A nurse in the emergency room reports it to police and Magdi is arrested and charged with domestic violence and assault. A restraining order is issued and he's told to stay far away from Ariat. In fact, Magdi is forced to move out of the very house he had worked so hard to buy. So this is a home that he feels is completely his. He paid for it with his earnings and there is no one who's going to keep him out of his house. His whole world was definitely, in his eyes at least, was about to come down. Everything tumbled for Magdi when after 24 years of marriage, Ariat files for divorce. The divorce? He, he learned by speaking with friends that have gone through it that half was going to go to his wife. Um, he learned that the domestic violence conviction would cost him his job, his respiratory license, and potentially he could go to jail. I remember my dad, he was just like, he was actually just, just shocked that she actually went against him and that she did that. Police now have a possible motive for murder. The only person really who had an obvious benefit to Ariad's death was Magdi. But cops can't connect the dots. They ping Magdi's phone at the time of the murder and find he's nowhere near the crime scene. Magdi had an alibi. Well, his alibi was he was at home and then he went to work early the next morning. And the biggest obstacle? Their own star witness, Ryan Gerges. Remember, Ryan says his mom's killer is an African-American male who he described as speaking gang slang. We had suspicion that my father had something to do with it, but there wasn't enough evidence to bring him forward to convict him or to go to trial. Eventually, the case goes cold for eight long years. Oh, I was really frustrated as the years went on and the case just uh, was getting colder and colder. 
Over that time, the boys barely talked to their dad. In fact, they remained determined to prove their own father was somehow behind their mother's murder. They asked Detective Wilson to take one more look at their mother's case, and he finds something right here in Ryan's interrogation. During that time, like, he was already taking off the shoestrings off my shoe. I noticed in uh, Ryan's statement that he mentioned that one of the suspects took off their gloves when they were trying to pull a shoe, shoestring out of his shoe. And I just thought that might be our best bet, uh, our best piece of evidence to actually uh, potentially get the suspect's DNA. Cops wonder if that shoestring could tie Magdy to his wife's murder. Detective Wilson sends it off for testing, and a month later... I got a call from the crime lab saying that they did find uh, a foreign DNA profile, and they submitted it through CODIS, and they got a hit. It's not Magdy Gerges. I was ecstatic, and the next question was, who is he and where is he? The answer? Anthony Bridget, a career criminal and a member of the notorious Trey 57 Crips gang. And get this, Bridget has a reputation as a hitman. The first thing I did was I pulled up Anthony Bridget's photo and I compared it to the sketch that Ryan had done of the suspect. And they were remarkably similar. Cops track down Bridget and it doesn't take long. He's serving time for a gang shooting at Salinas Valley State Prison in Northern California. They told him, hey look, uh, we found your DNA. We can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it's you. He was not interested in discussing anything. But District Attorney Whitney Bukowski says as cops are walking away, Bridget asks something that sounds alarms. His response was to ask where, at what location was the murder that they were talking about? Where did it happen? It's not exactly a confession, but it certainly sounds like a guy who's been around a few different murders. One of those scenarios, Magdy hired somebody, and potentially this person was from a gang, um, to commit the murder for him. Cops begin searching for a link between Magdy and Anthony Bridget. Search warrants were conducted on Magdy's phone and nothing from those records. We poured over financial records and we couldn't find an obvious aha payment of money to anyone or large cash withdrawals. So there wasn't any smoking gun about him paying this alleged hitman, which were our theory of the case. But cops and prosecutors are so convinced Magdi had something to do with his wife's murder, they come up with a plan, a risky plan. Our plan was to have two undercover officers posing as gang members approach Magdi at his house um, and request for additional money to keep quiet. This is the surveillance video of the undercover officers dressed in Trey 57 gang colors, moving into position with cameras and audio rolling. All right, stand by. He's lining up at the curb line here. Magdi is back living in his house, the same house where Ariat was murdered. He's going around to his trunk. The undercover cop going by the gang name G-Money needs Magdi to pay up or at least acknowledge the murder happened in this house. We had all kinds of worries about the plan not working. Finally, it's go time. I'll let you for a second. He acts like, I don't know what you're talking about. So G Money goes to plan B. The undercover cop passes Magdi a phone number. Like he doesn't know what to do. He's just Magdi Gerges doesn't know it, but he's been set up by the police. And it looks like he's dialing a number. Cops believe Magdi hired a hitman to murder his wife, Harriet, after she filed for divorce and threatened to take half of everything he believed belonged to him. That was his Achilles. He had already established that. The plan now, instead of fixing things with my mom, was going to be to try to get rid of her. DNA from a shoestring leads cops to one of Ariet's killers, a notorious gang member named Anthony Bridget. But he's already in prison on another charge and not talking. 
So Westminster police set up a sting, sending undercover officers to Magdy's house, one posing as Bridget's gang buddy named G-Money. He threatens to blow the whistle if Magdy doesn't come up with another five grand. We figured one of two things would happen. Uh, Magdy would pay these guys, maybe say some incriminating statements, or if he wasn't involved in the murder, report it to the police. Now it's the moment of truth for Magdy. Will he call the cops or G-Money? This is D-Money, what's going on? You stopped by yesterday. What's that? You know, my boy, you know, took care of a little business, you know, so we, you know, we just trying to get paid just to keep it hush. I thought you got everything. The magic words were, I already paid. And to me, that was probably the biggest moment of the investigation. It's almost as good as a confession, but G-Money takes it one step further, telling Magdy they need to get the money quick. We gotta try to get some in so we can get on out of town. 5,000 ain't that much, man, I, you know. Magdy's response, can we negotiate? 1,500 I have on me. No big surprise, the money tight Magdy, who never even bought his wife a headstone, actually haggles on the price to keep the killer quiet. True to form, we had asked for $5,000 to keep quiet, and he was negotiating for $1,500. I couldn't believe what I was seeing because his life has always been focused around money, and here he goes, you know, trying to negotiate payments to, to murder my mom and his wife. But then something cops never saw coming. Who was the middleman? What? Who was the middleman? Middleman? In that split second, Magdy turns the case upside down, revealing there is actually someone else involved in this elaborate scheme to murder his wife. That middleman is the one who actually hired Anthony Bridget and the man police call the Slayer. The assailant who actually almost cut off Ariat's head. What? Who was the middleman? G Money tries to play along, but he is sweating bullets. What? Who was the middleman? I don't. I, you know, every, everybody know who the middleman was. The middleman was. I ain't worried about that. People talking. I, I, I people, because I, I the information that I got, player, I can go to police, but I'm not. The quick-thinking undercover cop is G-Money in the bank. I think it was an Oscar-worthy performance. Uh, G-Money is a natural actor. I do believe that. All right, my you going to bring 1500 Okay. All right. When I saw, like, my dad actually had taken the number of these guys, went to a payphone, everything that I thought was confirmed. I thought that he had hired people. I thought he had done that and every single thing was confirmed 100% on that video. G-Money sets up a final meeting to collect the cash. If Magdy shows, cops will be waiting and not just with cameras, with handcuffs. Magdy is right on time. Oh, where are you at? What's up, my He hands over $1,500 to G-Money. Did you bring me a check? No. Cash. That's 15? Yes. 15 racks. It's gonna be over. You ain't gonna see us no more, man. All right, my friend. Sealing the deal and his fate. It was obvious that Magdy hired the killers to kill his wife. But before cops close in, G-Money hits Magdy with one more question. What the did your wife do so bad to you to make you want to kill her? Jesus. Everything good? All right, you take care, man. You too. Magdy doesn't fight. It's a wrap. <laughs> Cops swoop in and arrest Magdy. Magdy Gurgis thought he had gotten away with murder and that he was smarter than all of us. He was wrong. He's sentenced to life behind bars for conspiracy to commit murder and murder in the first degree. You have such a mixed emotion, but I think at that point, we were ecstatic because we knew that we were right and that we had the person who had orchestrated the murder of Ariad Gurgis. 
Anthony Bridget is also found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, murder in the first degree, and aiding and abetting the slayer. It was a great personal satisfaction, uh, not only for myself, but for Richard and Ryan and the rest of Ariad's family, just to see that at least part of her murder, um, justice was served. Cops are still searching for the last two pieces of this deadly puzzle. Who's the middleman and who's the other killer? Richard and Brian have begged their father to come completely clean, but Magdi Gerges still denies any involvement in his wife's murder. If my dad was watching this right now, I'd, I'd like to say that it's never too late to repent. Do it for me and Richard. He's not a dad. He's a father, biologically, but a dad would never do that to their kids. Two sons, now forever orphans, to murder and greed. Oh, I miss her. Yeah, I miss her every day. I miss her, and and I pray for her every day. I think Mom will be really proud of us. How far we've come along. Oh, I definitely think so. Yeah, and she'd be happy too that we got like uh, some justice in this case. That dad yeah. was caught, and that uh, Anthony Bridget guy was caught as well. Definitely. Yeah.